I found it really interesting that we have been talking about three rather different things. First, uh, Therese talked about open data, helping people um, make the most of open data. Then Tarje um, talked about um, open information. Um, that is um, the, the transparency that's required to actually exercise your, your right to free speech. And then um, at the end we had Juho who talked about open innovation. And it really struck me that although you come from maybe three different directions, um, you're all talking about openness in a very broad sense. And it seems to me that you're all calling for the, three ki the same kind of ingredients in order to make this work. Um, first, you said, Therese, that uh, we have moved from thinking about uh, open data as an end in itself, and now we should really sh shift our focus to make it more like a tool, and that it's really important to think about it in a strategic way. You, you, you actually said that originally it seemed that people would open up data in order to, um, to hope for serendipity to you know, come up with, with great solutions out of the blue, but it's, it's probably better to have some kind of strategy and to be clear what kind of problems you're trying to solve. And it, it um, occurred to me that you're all talking about requirements in terms of a, an open mindset, lots and lots of collaboration. You, Terry, talked about the fact that you actually try to help the government authorities that may struggle because now more people um, actually request documents and and obviously uh, you're a connector you're, you're trying to bring people together for them to collaborate you're all talking about the the time and effort required and somehow you're all talking about money <laughs> some of you would probably call it funding uh, hopefully you will you will say profit um, could could you could, did you have any uh, sort of um, perspectives on each other's presentations in terms of of these things because you come from different directions but you're all talking about the same thing basically. Um, yeah, maybe I have a reflection on the industry hack presentation. I find it quite interesting that companies are so interested in opening up and sharing a lot of their information and their data with startups that they haven't met yet. And I think it kind of shows that companies see a value in openness and in sharing and in open innovation, which we see as well at the ODI with the accelerators we run. Um, is it f difficult for you to convince those companies to kind of move towards that open innovation concept or do you see a lot of interest coming from them? I think kind of like it's uh, it's it's starting to starting to get there, and I think it's sort of like uh, important also to to notice that it, they are not really opening that publicly. So kind sure. of like they are not that business, business sensitive data uh, is not there in, in the kind of like in the open, but rather as, as as kind of like you talked about this closed, shared, and and, and open. It, it's somewhere in the kind of like shared, and it's it's shared to a specific group of people. That it's kind of like a, a sort of a, within every, every challenge there is sort of this uh, confidentially circle that uh, all the companies and people who are there, they are kind of accepted terms that we talk real things, but we don't really disclose those to the third party. And I think that's an important sort of like a step, uh, maybe uh, becoming even more open in the future. But if we start to take that, okay, now you actually have to open your, for example, manufacturing process data open, <laughs> open to, to anybody, then kind of like it's that, that's not the way to go, but exactly kind of building slowly mm -hmm. the capabilities and the ladder to, to, to benefit more and more of, of the openness. But I think it's, uh, to, to answer your questions, uh, more, more and more companies are starting to be ready and understanding the, the value of this more open collaboration. But of course, some companies are still lagging more behind than, than others. Uh, <coughs> to, to both of you, um, because uh, both of you are, are uh, helping different startups mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in your own ways. And, and, and in, in both your presentations, you, 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 you touch upon uh, many different groups that you mm. are in touch with. Mm. And um, open, open data is somehow the, the working material for all of this. Mm. Um, but both of you also obviously must encounter a lot of negotiations and possibly uh, tough discussions on intellectual rights mm -hmm. around how, uh, how to monetize on this raw material mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. which we all want and we all uh, use and analyze. Um, and, and, and 
Well, I haven't been working on 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 that arena. I'm I'm very curious on uh, your perspectives on 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 these initial discussions between what is open and free mm. and what is such a unique utilization of this raw material that somebody specifically can monetize on it and, mm -hmm. and nobody else. Mm -hmm. um, could, could you bring some, some experiences from the start of negotiations? Yeah, I think like it, it depends, of course, a bit on, on the w what is the data. If it's the kind of data shared by the industrial company about kind of like their processes, it's, it's of course their their IP and, 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 and sort of then it's about to kind of like negotiate with the startup how to how to monetize it, how to connect that with then the IP that the startup has created within within the challenge and, and kind of like that's exactly the kind of touching point that how to find the, the, the mutual agreement to, to go forward. And, and for example, we've tried to ease up that process in, in creating uh, templates also for in, in, in the format uh, from the legal perspective that, you know, this is actually the standard terms, how, how, how you participate and this is how, what, what we usually do and, 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 and kind of like uh, instead of uh, starting to really kind of like dig into the uh, deep legal departments of corporations and starting to mm. kind of like uh, f find a solution from there, but rather develop something from experience and then iterate it when, w whenever, whenever needed. Mm. So that's maybe one, one angle to try to tackle the, tackle the issue. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And kind of following up on points raised earlier that companies and governments increasingly see value in openness mm. and in open innovation. Um, on one of the startup accelerators we're running currently, which is called Data Pitch, we actually connect businesses that want to solve a particular challenge and provide data um, with startups to help solve that challenge. So kind of highlighting that direct benefit to opening your data helps in bringing that argument across. I guess you could talk about a wider discussion of whether data is a raw material like any other where there's actually clear ownership. If I make a phone call to you, who owns that data? Is it me because mm. I'm making the call? Is it the company that makes the connection? Mm. Is it you because you're receiving? We mm. tend to not think as data of being owned by one specific organization or person, but rather focus around how that data is being managed and used. Mm. Maybe one actually. We had an interesting discussion before entering the, uh, this this uh, this room with one one of the persons in the <laughs> in the audience about uh, we talked to a company uh, called Vino who is actually aggregating a lot of uh, open data from different sources and, and and sort of like making a tool for people to search knowledge about companies and they have actually grown very fast. I think with just something 150 people uh, organization within three years, so really growing fast and 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 heavily based basing the the business model on 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 the data that is openly available. So that's also I think an interesting perspective in the in the discussion. It could pose I think some interesting dilemmas: this the openness of the data, but then the closeness of of the profits that you may make from data or the insights mm. that you get from data or Whatever, and I think it's interesting that now you you're seated in the middle, Terje, and and you're actually working. Well, you're not working in a kind of of closed bubble because, as you said in the beginning, your paper needs funding too. You have made insun.no because you wanted to make this kind of of information, this kind of tool available to the world, and you had a question: Did that that did that actually increase traffic on on mm -hmm. your newspaper website? Because obviously, we all realize that even if you're doing a lot of this for ideological reasons, you still need to live. And you can only be an investigative journalist if somebody pays mm. your bills. So what do you think about that in terms of the freedom of speech, the right to, to mm. information and the money side of things? And I also touched upon, upon that when I asked mm. you the other way around that do uh, public authorities get upset when, mm. when you ask them so many questions and they <laughs> have to allocate funds to actually respond to these requests, mm. which are, um, you know, you're covered by law. You have the right to ask, but you know, could it be that these, uh, this money that they spend trying to answer your question could be spent on something better? Uh, there's another dilemma mm. there. True. So how do you feel about the money side? Um, well, uh, I, I have my job as a, as a journalist. Uh, what I'm, I'm always struggling for is, is the resource, which is the developer that I'm cooperating with. 
He has other tasks mm. as well, of course. Okay. We all need good coders for different purposes. Um, so there is a resource side. Um, since we made our tool free, um, uh, it, it did encourage cooperation. We gave it away to our competitors. Some of our competitors came back and said, this is wonderful, can we help you? Mm -hmm. So we are a commercial newspaper owned by Shipstead, which is also a big media company here in Sweden. Um, the Public Broadcasting Corporation came and said, um, can we help you? And that, that doesn't happen. We, we are supposed to be enemies, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> um, <coughs> so we did, it did uh, <coughs> encourage some, some, uh, uh, some, some, some good new connections. Um, in, 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 in the short term, uh, I see no income perspective for what we do at, at Insyn directly, uh, only hoping that it will improve journalism. In the future, maybe. Um, we, we will keep the services we have now uh, open and free. Um, but maybe on top of that, we can build something uh, because we are making a big database with struct structured information on, on the document flow in public sector. And, and, and as that material grows and gets better, maybe that is worth something. So maybe you could we sell could it build back to government or what? Maybe we could build um, a subscription uh, that, that you can be notified when, when there are documents that you might be specifically interested in. Um, this is a hint. You, you might want to send a FOIA for this document. Mm -hmm. Uh, because our data grows, mm. uh, and maybe that at least can can pay some of the bills, because my local newspaper is now taking most of the bill, and then uh, Stiftelsen Fritur, which is a, uh, a charity, is, is paying some of it. Mm. Yeah. But wait, what you're basically saying that all of you actually, when when you start to throw open in in the mix, sometimes mm. magic for want of a better word, starts happening because mm. people will actually come to you and say, can we be part of this? Can mm. we contribute somehow? Mm. But, but um, um, I think uh, in the long term, um, a project is viable if it solves a problem. Mm. If it doesn't solve a problem, it doesn't have the right to live. Uh, if it solves a problem, it, it may find a way to live. Mm. Mm. Do you think That's it's nice. a good um, measure of the sort of the the size of the problem it solves is whether or not people are willing to pay for it? Because you know it may solve a problem, but if people are not willing in the end to pay something for it, it may just be a, a nice to have and not a need to have. Even though I think most of us would agree that actually having the tools to exercise our right to freedom of speech is mm -hmm. not just a nice to have; it's definitely a need to have. But do we realize that on a daily basis? I wouldn't necessarily say that it's based on the amount that users pay for it. One of the examples I mentioned was CityMapper, mm -hmm. and it's a completely free application. Anyone can use it, mm -hmm. um, and it's easy, and it's free, and yeah. it's very helpful, and it's solving a very big problem. So mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily you can measure it based on that. I think what businesses are realizing as well is that release the value isn't necessarily in the data itself, but in the analytics and in the insights that you're getting from mm. that data, and that's mm. where the value comes in. And I think we're realizing that shift a mm. little bit, and with that realization, the open culture is growing a little bit mm. as well. Actually, Therese, you talked about the, the need, ju not just for data scientists and data science skills, but a lot more perhaps for uh, data literacy, so that everybody should be able to understand at least the basics of, of data. I see you nodding, Terry. Yeah. I'm, I'm not surprised. I was just wondering, do you see that there's a general shift towards that, towards an understanding that this is not just about um, tech startups, mm. this is not just about grassroots who wants to do something open for the sake of being open, or very um, sort of idealistic investigative journalists who will um, you know, do things in their spare time because it, uh, they think it's the right thing to do. Do you think there's a shift towards the, uh, the idea that this is something we should all somehow embrace and we all have a responsibility to, to promote it? Well, I think so. I think 
things are happening and we need to kind of catch up with it because mm. data affects all of us and the way data is used affects the way our lives are being designed and we need to learn to keep up with it. I'm always amazed now when I go on Facebook and there are advertisements on the side. Every advertisement is so interesting to me. It used to be that I buy a pair of shoes and then they put the same pair of shoes mm. and I, I already bought them, so no thanks. But now everything is just tailored for me and in a way that's amazing because it's very useful, but on the other hand, that means that my bubble is shrinking and shrinking. Mm. So I think we're all confronted with data and the impacts of data every day. And so we need to learn and understand those impacts to react to them. Agreed. And I think it was a great question from the audience about that how, how is this actually teach to the future mm. generations mm. and how is the kind of like, how are we helping to, to shape the mindset of, of the kind of like future makers? That how, how do they understand? Or will, uh, will understand the change because the, in any case the change won't <laughs> will will become faster and faster all the time and, and really I think it's it's important to to sort of like be 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 aware and, and be aboard and, and and sort of also take the responsibility of responsibility of, of making our future generations to understand it as well. Um, <coughs> I think we all have a responsibility, but we can't all do the same. Um, I think I will try to encourage my kids to learn code. Um, to my parents, uh, maybe that's a bit too late, um, but, but I'll still spend time giving them examples, giving them stories, how this is relevant, so that they mm. understand it, so that they participate in the debates around, mm. around it, because they still do. Um, in the end, we're not all going to be programmers. Mm. Somebody is going to drive that truck. Mm. And, and, and a good programmer mm. made that guy's mm. uh, day easier. Mm. Somebody is going to drive trains. At least some of the trains will still be driven by people mm. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 and somebody must construct and design it. So, so we're not all going to be uh, IT people. But we need to understand it. And, 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 uh, encourage the use of all, all of this. Now, you represent three different uh, countries. What, what are your impressions of what's being done to make sure that younger generations actually, if not grow up understanding this, but at least mm. have some chance of grasping what's going on around them and grasping the importance of, of paying uh, attention to these kind of things? Well, in Finland, there is a different kind of initiatives. Uh, for example, one top of my mind, one that comes to my mind is, is, is it called Me Hack It, which is kind of like all about teaching the uh, high school uh, kids the uh, kind of very basics on, on, on be it coding, on being creating something visual, or really kind of like just understanding the opportunities and possibilities of technology. And I think it was good, good what you said that it's it's not about making everyone like a deep, uh, <laughs> deep understander and, and doer of, of, of that kind of like very very hardcore tech, but really understanding the basics and, and tying it to the concept context of of sort of like a normal life is, is, is super, super important. And if we think, look at like, like uh, university uh, students at the moment, if we take 10 years back, no one was even thinking about entrepreneurship, but actually doing something their own as a viable option, but they were looking mm -hmm. for very different directions. And now if you go to ask from the freshmen that are they aspiring to maybe, you know, make a great impact and build something of their own, 80% raises their hands. So it's kind of like also the, the mindset shift and, and culture shift, what has been uh, pretty, Pretty, uh, pretty big uh, and experienced in, in, in Finland at least, but I think it's touching the, the, the whole area of Nordics and world even, but kind of like still. Mm. Yeah, I think the important thing is to highlight the fact that it's not just for technology and to make it tangible and to make it approachable to younger kids. I think in a way they might find it easier because they grow up with these challenges and if we understand them then we can teach them as well, but I think a lot of work still needs to be done. Well, the role of the journalist is easier here. We can find the good stories about this and write them, <laughs> and thereby spread awareness mm. on how this can be used in, in sound manners. Um, mm. So I, I'll try to do that. <laughs> good. And, 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 and uh, try to encourage some of my colleagues to do the same. Uh, it's good stuff to read about. 
I think you mentioned, Therese, that some of your friends know exactly what you're talking about when you talk about your jobs, but you also know people who have absolutely no idea what, what open data is about. Is the thing, like perhaps that's what you're suggesting, Terry, that um, sometimes we shouldn't talk about open data, we should talk about the things that we can do now that we have a digital world. Mm. That we tend to either talk about the digital world in very abstract sense, or we talk very specifically about open data, and that sort of naturally excludes a lot of people who think, well, that's the sort of thing that you talk about if you're a geek or something. At least it was my impression from when I worked in the Danish government that it was pretty much either or. We talked about digital society as a whole, and then we talked about open data, and that had a lot to do with hackathons and data portals and uh, developers, full stop. Sometimes we threw in the word innovation, but often not. So you're talking again about you're defining the problem or you know making it useful in a broader sense. Yeah, totally. I mean, open data is great just in itself, mm -hmm. because it gives us access to information, but it only really becomes valuable when it's being used. And in reality, from our startup incubation uh, programs, we see that jobs are being created, we see that new industries are being developed, we see new products that make people's lives easier. So there are tangible results that are linked to open data, mm -hmm. and it's worth talking about them and highlighting them and understanding open data as an important ingredient to make that happen, mm -hmm. I think. And it's about the kind of like the, the outcome and the, the w what is the impact you want to mm -hmm. achieve and what kind of like sort of where are we aiming and then what kind of tools are we using to actually aim to that. And I think open data provides a very, very interesting opportunities for that. But it's just kind of like it's, it's, it's one tool among many others. So in, in a way like it's, it's sort of like think, thinking of what, what, what is wanted to be achieved and then, then kind of like uh, use, use the best knowledge and best uh, resources possible to, to go there, towards that. Um, when I, I tried, it wasn't necessary in this audience to use the picture of me with the paper piles, but it was necessary to communicate uh, with, with my parents and, 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 and their friends um, yeah. Uh, in, in the neighborhood in my hometown, um, why on earth are we doing this? We, we had to be very concrete. Mm. We had to show the problem and then provide the solution in order to create an understanding on, 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 on what can be done with these tools. Um, and and um, all, all of your innovators, I assume, are solving one or more concrete problems. Uh, so the more those stories are told and visualized in easy ways, that awareness will, will, yeah. will spread. The storytelling plays an important part here. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I agree. And that's why I liked the picture, actually, because it showed clearly you were facing a problem and you were mm -hmm. trying to find a solution for it. And in my experience, that usually is how things happen. So it's not someone who's a coder and thinks, what could I code? <laughs> um, yeah. It's more that people do things and they face exactly. a challenge and they find yeah. a solution for that. And yeah, definitely it's very important to communicate those success stories well. And I have been asked so many times, I don't even know how many times, what kind of impact can we expect from opening up data or opening up information or even just opening up our processes to allow other people to come in, contribute to our innovation. And that's why I was so happy to see that um, you actually include some numbers on that. I know the ODI has been very good at trying to quantify what kind of, of change are we actually trying to make here and, and how does it work? And also you, you actually showed how many teams did you, yeah. did you have to go through the, the challenges, how many challenges did you have and how many, many uh, prototypes and products yeah. did you get out in the end? Because apart from telling stories to people who may not be interested in, in sort of the, the data, the nitty-gritty parts of the data itself, I suppose it's also important to, you know, in order to get funding to show that you're not just having fun. I mean, it is, I hope you're having a fun. It sounds like you're having fun, and I hope that that also goes for, for everybody here, but you're actually making some kind of change. There's an impact, and you can 
somehow quantify the impact and say, well, if we didn't open up this data or if mm. we didn't help these people in this way, this would not have been possible. Like that you can show that mm. you could not have written some of the stories that you wanted to write. You could not have exposed what was really going on if you didn't have access mm. to searchable records mm. rather than mm. piles and piles mm. of, of paper. Mm. Do you think there's a there's a challenge in, in finding the right way to document that this actually makes a difference? Mm. Uh, in, in, uh, in my case, uh, you can quantify it by FOIA requests sent mm. or uh, stories written um, to, 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 to keep it in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the media sector. But um, uh, I, I uh, pers personally um, uh, get more ins even more inspired when I see that we are being used by somebody else, someone mm. from the outside of my media bubble. Mm. Mm. Uh, and even though I have written um, more than 100 critical articles about the armed forces, and perhaps non-positive, uh, I, I, uh, I, I was really glad when I got my first phone call from, from somebody working in the arms industry who was using my tool, filing FOIA requests to sell weapons to Norwegian armed forces uh, in a more efficient way, because then it worked. Then it had been uh, spreading awareness to, to, to somebody completely other than me and mm. other than my friends. Mm. Um, and that's good, uh, even though uh, I don't really like what he's doing. Uh, I, I, I see that it, it can be used in different ways. Um, so, so it's difficult to, to, to find a good measure for everything. Um, uh, but, but work created in the archives is, is one, of the, one of the good measures. <laughs> because it means practical transparency, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the opening up is a kind of it's it's one part of the process, but it's the critical part because <laughs> in the end that's that's where it all starts. That's mm -hmm. how you can actually things like that happen that someone actually has the possibility they use and it, it kind of like it, it, it has the possibility to spread. So in a way, if thinking of the industry hack context, that's the whole starting point. Nothing, no results, nada. <laughs> if there wasn't this opening up and and kind of like willingness to 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 do that and experiment, what could actually follow from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to measure what we can measure and to use that also for us to kind of measure how successful we are at what we're doing. So not only to convince the outside world, mm. but also to ho hold ourselves to account. But there's a limit. So we measure jobs, people employed by the startups we incubate, um, mm. how much investment they received and, and so on. But like the stories you mentioned, you may publish a story and then you can read, uh, you can check how many people read it. But that mm. only tells you so much mm. of what an impact mm. you had because people might read the story and then share it with someone else. They may, it may influence their decisions. And I think there are wider impacts beyond the narrow things that we can measure that we also need to mm. recognize. And perhaps also now that we've had these uh, interesting insights into how the three of you actually work, just hearing the story of how you make things happen. I mean, often, it, of course, it's interesting to know what you do, but I think it's a lot more interesting to know exactly how you do it. So you actually explain the mechanics that if, if this data was not available, nobody could have done anything. If these experts were not on hand to help facilitate the process, this would not have done. If we did not have a good screening process to match the right teams with the right company, this would not happen. Mm -hmm. To explain those stories, and I suppose also uh, from uh, you know, a media point of view, explaining that the story you just read was made because we made a FOIA request. Mm. And that would not have been possible had we not had this tool in which mm. we could search for records and mm. things like that. To explain the sort of the inside of things without having to go into the, the details of, of all the, the tech stuff. Mm. Mm. Do we have like just one question for, for the panel from, from the crowd now that you have the chance? Otherwise, uh, we're going to release you to lunch we have one question. Just, just about economics. Uh, uh, 
figures from United mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kingdom. Uh, your presentation was it? Uh, what was the year of those? Uh, sorry, sorry oh, for, yeah. for her. <laughs> yes. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, what sorry. was the figures? Uh, economic figures. What was the source of the year of those? What you presented? The economic figures. Yeah. That estimation was done, I think, in 2016. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think so. All right. I think that wraps up our first session on, on open data. Thank you very much. Thanks for great questions from the audience. Now you may go and have lunch, but I hope to see you again this afternoon where we have a second session with two interesting speakers. See you later. <laughs>